Hello, Detlef. Good. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. How are you all holding up with, uh, with uh, Corona? Yeah, it's, uh, we were lucky. We did not see much devastation in the first wave, which was in July or so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, infection was there, but the, it quickly uh, tapered off. But now we see a high infection rate, like 8% or so. Uh, hospitals and government is warning, but our people are, you know, they, they are happily not following the SOPs. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, they, so, but we all are scared at the moment because the rate is going up. Infection rate is going fast up. So we are nowhere closer to the peak, I would say. Uh, mm. Yeah, I hear it has been going up and down. So who knows where, yeah. where, where it is um, um, going. So yeah, so, so, so it, it, one of the most interesting things that I read was the, you know, so people here are all upset about uh, 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 Christmas and whatnot. But, you know, then the newspaper said in many Muslim countries was Ramadan, it actually worked quite well. So it actually said the the Germans should look to how people did it during Ramadan and get their act together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we actually, uh, the first peak in Pakistan came after the Ramadan because, okay. Okay. you know, we all went out partying and, uh, you know, family gatherings in, in Pakistan, you know, there are big family gatherings on the Eid, mm. on the feast immediately after the Ramadan. And, uh, you know, we saw real, uh, and mm. everybody was hearing somebody is sick in family, mm. in close mm. friends and relatives, and there were deaths. But we were very fortunate that it, I would say, uh, there was no real intervention from government or real steps, which uh, brought the peak down. So mm -hmm. we were lucky that I think it, it was followed by some environmental changes. I have no idea, but yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, and now we are uh, seeing a much higher ratio because of this winter season, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is the situation there in, in, in your city? We, um, so, so actually, it's, it's, it's really quite interesting. So 500 meters from here is actually where vaccine is going to be produced. So there are three big companies uh, uh, with uh, mRNA vaccines. And one of them is uh, right here. It's literally on the other side of the, um, of the street. So this has been obviously big in the, uh, very big in the news the whole time. So here we have a big hospital and they have uh, plenty of ICU beds and so on. So um, we are not too worried, but it's, it's actually not, I think it's really misguided to talk about ICUs and how many people are in hospital because the best thing is nobody is in hospital. Because I think if you get sick, it's, it's bad no matter what. Hmm. Okay, so let me introduce you and then we start. Uh, okay. So one thing I, I wanted to ask you, uh, you did really fast PhD if I, I, so I was just reading about you. Yes. Uh, so, yes. so your diploma was from University of Cologne, 1981 to 86. And then 1988, you did PhD from MPI, uh, where I think you are presently now in developmental biology. Is it true? Yes. Two years? Uh, yeah, I, it, I, I started my PhD in October of 86 and I graduated in uh, October of 88. So wow. with, uh, Super I think, fast. Uh, I think, uh, five or six papers or so. Wow. <laughs> but it was a different time. It's, uh, that was uh, 35 years ago. So science was, uh, was, was different. So I was at the right place at the right, uh, at the right time. But I, I, so I knew already very well what I wanted to do. And so actually uh, I could start with my experiments on day one. So I had other people I had asked other people to already prepare everything. So, so I was doing uh, Newton screens with uh, Drosophila flies. So when I arrived, all the flies were there. So I could actually start to fully work on, on the first day. It's, it's, 
I think it's still pretty, I mean, it's pretty, still pretty amazing. This is 35 years ago, right? So there was no whole genome sequence and whatnot. And so I uh, wanted to clone a gene by positional cloning. And back then it typically would take three or four years. And then you would, after you had the gene, you would do whatever you do. So, but I had prepared everything. So I had the gene cloned in three months instead of three years. So basically the, that, that explained why, you know, my PhD was really short because that initial phase of two or three years, I was lucky enough that uh, uh, I managed to do it just in a few months. Really impressive. So you moved from fly to Arabidopsis then. So the postdoc was in Arabidopsis at SOC? And uh, no, I was uh, in Caltech. At, uh, at Caltech with Elliot Myrowitz, who had also worked in on Drosophila. And actually, what is really quite a funny um, um, story is so um, Elliot Myrowitz was a postdoc at Stanford with Dave Hognes, who just passed away a few months ago. He was one of the you know uh, heroes in molecular biology, and so. He arrived there together with somebody else called Welcome Bender. And there were two paradigms for development. And one paradigm for development was to try to clone homeotic genes. And so the other paradigm for development was to work on salivary glands. So just, I, I, I expect so many here have seen Drosophila uh, larvae in, in the vials. And so when you see them in a vial, they climb up the you know, uh, wall of the vial and then glue themselves as pupae to the side of the vial. And that's also what they do in nature. They, they, they climb up somewhere and then glue them to whatever they are. So anyway, and so this glue is being produced in the salivary glands. And they have these genes which are called the salivary gland glue genes, okay? And so these proteins, that was the genes were known back then, but the proteins were known to be very, very abundant and only in the salivary gland. So the other paradigm was to study these salivary gland uh, uh, glue genes, okay? And then so, so these two people arrived, Elliot Myrowitz and Welcome Bender, and David Hogner said, well, you know, who wants to study homeotic genes and who wants to study salivary gland glue genes? And then Elliot Myrowitz, who again, I'm sure many here, have uh, uh, um, heard of, he said, well, it's obvious that the salivary gland glue genes are much more interesting and will tell us a lot more about development. Obviously the cloning of the homeotic genes led to, you know, discovery of homeobox and so on and so forth and started a whole revolution in developmental biology. So, so that decision in, 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 you could say was a bad decision by Elliot Marowitz. But then when he set up his own, G, uh, own lab, you know, he realized that maybe that was not the best decision and he started to work on Arabidopsis. So we're really lucky that Elliot made a wrong decision, if you will, as a postdoc. So, but now I come back to my work as a PhD student. So the gene that I worked on was a gene that was active in embryonic development. But um, as we later found out, it's also the master control gene for the salivary glands. So Elliot always wanted to find the master controller of salivary gland glue genes. And that he never found that master controller. And that master controller turned out to be the gene that I cloned as a PhD student. I did not either find out that it was the master controller for Elliot's gene. Somebody else found that out after Elliot and I had both left Drosophila. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty funny you know, science history uh, 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 story, if you, if you will, how the uh, wrong decision was actually really, really good for plant biology. And I'm really happy Elliot made that wrong decision because otherwise I would not have been a postdoc in his lab. Wow. Uh, knowing Elliot Myrowitz's work, I mean, you have covered a lot of history already. ABC model of flowering and, uh, you know, welcome Bender's uh, homeotic genes. Um, such a history you have already covered. So let me introduce you. Uh, so it's a real player, uh, and when I say real player, it's it's an honor for me introducing Detlef today uh, and having him with us today. So uh, as we just briefly talked about, so uh, Detlef he did his uh, diploma from University of Cologne in uh, 1986 and did a super fast PhD as he just explained from MPI Developmental Biology in uh, 1988, and he moved on for postdoc. Uh, with Elliot Marovitz, as he said, 
uh, at Caltech from 1989 to 93, uh, when he finally became assistant professor and then also associate professor at Salk Institute uh, in uh, USA. Uh, he remained at Salk Institute uh, till 2002, uh, when he finally became director of uh, Max Planck Institute of Developmental Biology, uh, where he is presently uh, still the executive director of MPI DevBio. He is member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, uh, the ne German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina, and the Royal Society. And uh, he is also a recipient of several awards, and most recently the Novozymes Prize uh, of the Novo Nordisk Foundation. So the major first major finding from his lab was actually that an Arabidopsis gene could uh, dramatically accelerate flowering of trees. Uh, and this finding actually established uh, a proof of concept for Arabidopsis genetics as a platform for biotech discovery. His group later discovered the first plant microRNA mutant uh, and identified the factor which uh, we all know to be the long sought after mobile flower inducing signal. Uh, Detlef was also one of the first to exploit natural genetic variation for understanding how the environment affects plant development. Uh, and in the recent years, his work uh, has come to incorporate questions at the interface of evolution and ecology for example, how can wild plants adapt to climate change and how do they manage to keep their pathogens at a bay? Uh, in his research, he draws uh, on the fruits of collaborative effort initiated over a decade ago to sequence the genomes of over 1,000 uh, natural Arabidopsis thaliana strains, uh, which is famously known as the 1001 uh, Genome Project. Detlef has an uh, extensive record of services to the scientific community, having served on the series of editorial and advisory boards. He is also a strong proponent of open access publishing and founding deputy editor of eLive. Uh, he's also a co-founder of three biotech startups. Detlef, it's a real player, over to you. Uh, so we will not disturb you during your talk. So at the end of your converse, uh, talk, we will ask you questions. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm 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 really pleased to to be there. I, I would love to be there in, in in person. Obviously, that is really difficult in in uh, in this time. But on the other hand, it allows me to transport myself at least in spirit within a few minutes from uh, uh, the center of Europe to Lahore, which is thousands and thousands of uh, kilometers uh, away, and I, I wish we could, you know, all uh, talk in person, but uh, I hope things will change again and that such a visit will be uh, possible in, in, in future. So let me share my screen and um, tell you uh, a bit about what um, I've been thinking about and uh, be fascinated by in the past 10 um, years or so. So this story is about um, epistasis, uh, the spice of life, as I like to think of it, and uh, evolution, and what we have learned from epistasis about the plant immune system. And just to get this out of the way, so, um, so that you know what my uh, financial incentives uh, are, apart from being a director at the Max Planck Institute, uh, already mentioned, I'm a deputy editor of eLife, I consult for KWS, I'm a co-founder of Computomics, and I'm on the medical advisory board of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And uh, I'll mention uh, the people who contributed to the work that I'll uh, present as we uh, go along, but uh, here are already some of the important names. Christina Baragan, Lei Li, and uh, Derek Lundberg are currently still in the lab. On Yong Che is an assistant professor at National University of Singapore now. Talia Karasov is at the University of Utah. Dan Koenig at, at UC Riverside and Manuela Neumann just uh, left to join Bosch Global to actually help them develop rapid uh, testing device for infectious diseases, including um, Corona. So I'm a geneticist. Genetics is what I love. I even wrote a 
essay on this, Why I Love Genetics, uh, published in the journal Genetics a few years ago. And uh, I love genetics because they are these cool phenomena. And I would argue the coolest thing is really epistasis. So with, without epistasis, genetics would be completely boring because um, without epistasis, hybrids would be strictly intermediate. So here are some arbitrary phenotype. Here are some two genotypes, A and B. And if we cross them together, make the genotype AB without epistasis, the phenotype would be strictly um, intermediate. So we could predict outcome of any cross. Fortunately, there is epistasis. And this is the epistasis that I learned as a developmental geneticist. And that is where one parent is largely dominant. So the hybrid looks either like the A or B parent. In this case, it looks like the B parent. Now, one of the things that I want to share about epistasis is that, and that bothered me for a long time, um, there are actually different definitions of uh, epistasis. So there is this um, other definition of epistasis where you have a hybrid effect that is uh, not that of one of the parents, but something completely different. And I like to think of it as sort of evolutionary magic and hybrid vigor positive heterosis is such um, evolutionary magic. So here you have two parents and this is the hybrid that you get from crossing these two parents. And you see that this hybrid is much, much better than, than either parent and here it is shown formally. So you might ask, um, this is really sort of confusing that you know there's this definition epistasis, meaning you look like one of the parents and then the other definition, why well, you do not look like any of the parents. So where, where does this actually come from? And I didn't know myself and I only found this out, I think about a couple of years ago, I, I dug into the literature. So the first mention of epistasis was actually by um, Bateson. Um, it's important in the history of the uh, plant biology lab and that's also the John Innes Center, which I'm sure many of you have um, heard about. And so he was um, uh, thinking, you know, making crosses and then having exactly what I showed you that um, one gene was basically masking the effects of another gene and therefore he called these interactions epistatic and hypostatic and this can be found in his book on Mendel's principles of heredity which had just been rediscovered um, at the time. Now, so, so where does this other definition of epistasis come from? Well, it comes actually from another luminary of genetics from R.A. Fisher and uh, comes from this 1918 uh, paper. And he was thinking about epistasis in a little bit different way. He was thinking about, for example, that being male or female would generally modify lots of phenotypes. So, and he thought, well, that's probably not, you know, individual genes interacting with each other, but a more global, pheno global phenomenon. And that's why he, you know, thought epistasis was a good uh, coin, uh, term for this. Now, wh why do I bring this up? Well, the interesting thing here is that uh, Punnett, whom you all know from Punnett Square, actually pointed out in his review that uh, Bateson had already used this term and maybe it was a bad idea to you know, use the same term for something that was sort of related, but really quite different. Well, Fisher, uh, he was known to be quite full of himself. He blew off the reviewers, he published his paper anyway, and we are stuck with these two different definitions of epistasis. All right, so small excursion into, into history, coming back to the topic at hand. There's, I told you about epistasis as evolutionary disaster, but there's also this other side of the coin, epistasis, uh, sorry, epistasis as evolutionary magic. There's the other side of the coin where epistasis really is evolutionary disaster rather than magic, um, where you make a cross and then this hybrid is much inferior to either parent and that's, can call it negative heterosis, but it's also called hybrid weakness. So how did we um, get into this in uh, the first place? Like many good stories in science, this started by chance observation. It started with uh, my graduate student at the time, Jan Lempe, um, almost 20 years ago. We were working on flowering and she was working with these two wild strains of Arvidopsis thayana that came from this village here, Umkirch, not very far from uh, Tübingen near Freiburg. And she saw that this strain UK3 flowered earlier than this strain UK1. And we thought, well, um, they come from the same place. So maybe they're genetically really, really similar. 
maybe it's just a single gene that is mutated and that makes a difference in flowering. Why don't we you know, investigate this genetically? So first thing that you do as a geneticist, you make a cross. Well, a few weeks later, Yannick comes back and says, well, I can't tell you, you know, what the hybrid, uh, when the hybrid flowers. And I said, why not? And she said, well, they look really strange. And so this was the result of the cross that she got. She got these plants that were really, really small. And we were scratching our head and we were staring at these plants, for example, under the scanning electron microscope and couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And we were sort of trapped in our thinking as developmental biologists. So we thought, yeah, this must be a developmental phenomenon. That's also why we thought it was, 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 was interesting. So was, while we were scratching our heads, um, Kirsten Bombleys, who is now a professor at ETH, joined the lab and she made many more crosses between wild strains of Arabidopsis thayan and she found uh, several similar cases. So we knew this is something that we could study because it was not just a one-off phenomenon, but something for which we had several examples. So because we couldn't figure out what was going on with the plants, we said, let's interview the plants. Now, it's difficult you know, to talk to plants. Well, you can talk to plants, but they normally do not answer. So the way that we interviewed the plants is by um, asking what are their gene expression profiles. And back then, it was still with uh, microarrays. And we had these three hybrids. They were all smaller than the parents, but you can see that they look quite different. So this one actually not so bad, whereas this one here is really, really tiny. But even though the hybrids look really different, you see the gene expression programs were quite similar. So similar sets of genes induced or repressed in these um, hybrids. And when we looked at what kind of genes those were, um, we saw that they related to immune response. And then we looked at the plants in a little bit more uh, detail. And then at the time we had uh, started to team up with my friend, Jeff uh, Dangle at uh, University of North Carolina, an expert in plant immunity. We looked at these plants and we saw that uh, there was rampant cell death in the leaves of these uh, plants. And, the cell death is, is a typical sign of immunity. So together with the gene expression profile, simple conclusion, we're dealing with autoimmunity. Now, um, those of you who do not work all the time with plants will say, hey, what's going on there, immunity in plants? Well, of course, plants have an immune system. It works a bit different than our immune system, but they also have to defend themselves against pathogens and parasites. So plants are very aware that there are dangerous microbes everywhere. Now the plants that we are dealing with, um, they not only are aware that in principle dangerous microbes are everywhere, but they apparently imagining that they are being attacked by microbes even when there are no microbes around. So we think of them sort of as paranoid plants. They mount an uh, immune response even though there is no reason to do so. So simple hypothesis, I'm sure you already figured this out, in the hybrid, what we're doing, we're putting two genomes together and how pathogen detection works is that genomes encode pathogen detectors and uh, they normally recognize pathogens, but here we think one genome recognizes something from the other genome as being foreign or pathogen derived. So that was our initial hypothesis. So, um, and, and I should uh, mention this phenomenon uh, known as hybrid necrosis is really common form of hybrid weakness in flowering plants. When Kirsten went back to the literature, she saw that there was hundreds, there were hundreds of cases described by breeders and naturalists, here two cases from wheat, for example, although not in maize, which is um, interesting because obviously maize is such a very well studied organism. So we went on, looked into the genetics, um, we found genetics is simple. Uh, often there's only one or two genes uh, involved. In this case, uh, two genes involved. This is a QTL map, uh, call these genes dangerous mix, DM1 um, on chromosome five, DM2 on chromosome three. And this just shows that they act in a joint manner epistatically. So first gene that we cloned was DM1 and encodes an NLR immune receptor. Here is a structure, beautiful structure from colleagues Gigi Chai and Zhang Ming Zhu uh, published about a year ago, well, uh, early last year, almost two years ago now, of, these, uh, of such an NLR receptor, nucleotide binding site leucine receptor, which forms this penamine here. So um, 
we were delighted exactly what we thought, you know, because we thought we have these uh, two genomes interact with each other and so, uh, one genome recognize the other genome as something from the other genome as foreign, makes perfect sense that we have such an immune receptor. When you look at this region of the genome, this is, uh, we're looking at Aridopsis diana, we're just looking at three different uh, strains. And you see that, you know, this is uh, very different, this region of the genome, but this is very, very typical for animal R genes and we come back to this. So the reference allele has two copies of this gene here. Um, this one here where we have the good allele. So the one that does not cause the, the problems, um, these genes are actually interrupted. And then here's so only one complete gene with 20% amino acid differences. So within a species, two different alleles, 20% amino acid differences is of course, you know, crazily diverse. This is the sort of difference that you normally would see between species that are millions and millions of years ago, but it's typical for NLR uh, immune receptor genes. Okay, so we were very, very happy. Went on clone DM2, so mentioned one gene will recognize something from the other genome as foreign pathogen derived, fits perfectly. Clone the next gene, we were in for surprise, so we expected it to encode some random gene, but turns out DM2 also encodes an NLR immune receptor. Again, this region of the genome is crazily diverse. So at least there's one answer. This uh, uh, hybrid necrosis comes from interaction between genes that are very, very different between different accessions. And in fact, these NLR immune receptor genes are the most diverse genes that you find within the species. Most diverse meaning that they are very, very different from different um, individuals. So how do we explain this, that we found two immune receptors? Uh, uh, I have to briefly explain to you how these immune receptors um, work. So they can bind uh, ATP and ADP. And by that definition, obviously they are enzymes because they change ATP to um, ADP. And so the thinking is, and that's from this uh, review by Takan and Tamaleng, that in the ADP bound uh, form, here bound to the nucleotide binding site, the Receptor is in an off state in this closed uh, conformation. Here, the leucine rich uh, repeats. And this is the business end, the tur domain, and the CC domain, and it's not available for signaling. And when a pathogen effector comes along, it uh, uh, catalyzes the exchange of ADP to ATP. And then in the ATP found bound form, this is in the on state. So in here, this tur CC domain is available for signaling. Now, because this is an enzyme, of course, this exchange between ADP and ATP, it's uh, stimulated by the pathogen effector, but an enzyme will always go back and forth between the different um, states, as, as, as you know. And so our examination is DM1 and DM2, which we showed actually exist together in a complex. Um, we have um, an NLR state that is too far along on this, uh, uh, on this cycle from off to on state. So, any NLR receptor will go back and forth between off and on state, and preferably it is going to be mostly or completely in the off state without the pathogen effector, and as completely as possible in the on state when the pathogen effector is there. But you will always have both states coexist, no matter whether pathogen effector is there. And what we apparently are dealing with was DM1 and DM2, that the complex is just too often in the on state, even without a pathogen um, effector. So the bottom line here is these uh, proteins make complexes. And if you complex the same partners with each other, then you shift this uh, balance here and that, cannot, that might not be good for the plant. All right. So around the time that we had started to figure this out, on Yung Chi uh, joined the lab, that's um, again a decade ago now. And she said, let's look at this much more systematically. And at that point, then we became Aerodopsis thiana breeder. So we had just uh, sequenced 80 different strains of Aerodopsis thiana. That was the first phase of the 1001 Genomes Project that uh, Tariq just mentioned. Um, so um, On Young um, and her colleagues, they made all possible, or almost all possible crosses between these 80 um, strains. And what you, they come from different geographic uh, regions, you can see that um, these incompatibilities are distributed throughout um, this space of uh, crosses. So importantly, when you would look along this line, you see that you also find plenty of incompatibilities within regions. So it's not just when you cross things that come from 
uh, very uh, far away geographic distances. Um, by severity, we can put them in different classes. This magenta here is the worst class. Blue is a very mild class. And we think it's sort of a ice of the tip of the iceberg situation that in addition to this mild class that we can observe, there might be other even milder cases that we can't see by eye, but that you would detect molecularly. So uh, basically you, you have not quite the right combination of immune receptors and that could already um, elevate uh, it, the, the immune state of the plant. That's, that's still um, uh, um, speculation. But you see, it's, it, it, it's really quite, quite common. So as I said, at that time, we had, of, uh, um, uh, um, we had um, oops, Let's see, we had already, ah, here it goes. So we had already cloned um, quite, we, we had uh, a sequence, all these strains. So cloning these genes became quite straightforward. And um, for all the cases that we had observed, except for these mild cases, we then proceeded to find the causal genes. These are the five chromosomes of Arabidopsis thayaner. And in color is given the density of NLR genes, these genes that encode these nucleotide binding site loose and rich repeat immune receptors. And you see right away that almost all of these genes map to regions of the genome where you encode these NLR immune receptors. And so you have all kinds of uh, genetic constellations. So for example, you have a constellation where you have two alleles at the same locus that interact with each other to uh, cause hybrid necrosis. Here's one of our uh, favorite uh, loci, DM2, one of the ones that we cloned early on. It was this really, really crazily diverse locus. So you see there are five different alleles and each allele interacts with something else elsewhere in the genome. And then this here is my um, favorite uh, case, the interaction between uh, this locus here, DM7 and DM6, where we have three different alleles at this locus interacting with three different alleles at this locus. And this encodes an NRI immune receptor and this encodes a different type of immune protein, which I will tell you about in a few minutes. But for geneticists, when you have these allele specific interactions, where you have specific alleles on one side interacting with specific alleles on the other side, that for a geneticist says it's a protein protein interaction. Um, and I have to admit that as a geneticist, I would have been perfectly happy to leave it there, but I have you know, these good colleagues in plant immunity and they are really obsessed with biochemistry and so on. And they really bullied me into uh, pursuing what was going on with the proteins, which they were right because it turned out to be very interesting. So Christina Barragan, who is uh, going to defend her um, thesis in a few days. And I, I'll show you something very quickly if you, if you can see me. Uh, If you have my, if you still see where I am. So just show this that the lab produced this uh, uh, head for her dissertation, which we will give her the day after tomorrow. All right. Okay. So, so Christina um, looked at these, and you see here these three different pairs. And only when you cross mark zero with KZ10, you see hybrid necrosis, but not when you, for example, cross mark zero with um, phase zero, and so on and so forth. And um, so at that time, uh, I was, uh, we were joined in the lab by um, Lei Li, and he came from uh, 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 John Ju's uh, lab. And can this? what is going on here, it's a little bit slow. Um, so lay, um, let me see why does it not, ah, yeah, um, all right, okay, it's going on. So this shows again, um, uh, uh, this crazy diversity also at RPW8 in this case, this other immune locus and um, you know, you don't have to look at the details, important is just they are multiple genes and then there's this crazy diversity. So we were joined by Lei Li and uh, Lei actually had written to me. He were, had been a graduate student with Jean Minju, one of the colleagues who had worked on NLR receptors. And so Lei wrote to me and said, uh, dear Dr. Weigel, um, I would like to do a postdoc with you. I followed with interest your work on hybrid necrosis. And while it is very clear to me that you are an excellent geneticist, you do not really know anything about biochemistry or proteins. 
So I have a proposal. Let me join your lab. You will teach me about genetics and natural variation, and I will teach you about biochemistry and proteins. And you know, I thought that was a good bargain. I said, please come join the lab, and it worked out perfectly. So what Lei was able to demonstrate was that these RPWA proteins apparently act as ligands for the NLR immune receptor protein. So um, here we have HR4. It's, uh, uh, we have two different versions. We have the version that causes hybrid necrosis or immunity. We have this other version here called zero that does not. And then RPP7, we have two versions, A and B, very similar to each other. B is the one that causes problems. A uh, is the one that does not. And so this is a, a blue native page a gel where you can resolve higher order protein complexes. And you see when you put the two um, uh, RPP7B and HR4, the two proteins together, HR4P0, that cause hybrid necrosis, you form this large uh, complex of about a megadalton. But when you have the other combinations, you do not, or, or very little of this. So um, what do we think uh, is going on there? Well, we think this really conforms to this initial idea where one uh, genome recognizes something from the other genome as having to do with pathogens. So without going into the details here, there are homologs of these RPW8HR4 proteins and other systems in uh, fungi and animals and so on and so forth. They are also involved in uh, self, non-self discrimination and they form uh, pores in the membrane. And so that's apparently a way to kill cells. And we actually know these HR4 proteins, our HR4 proteins, we can express them in yeast cells, we can express them in E. coli, and they will kill those cells apparently because they make holes into the membrane. Okay, so, so we think uh, making holes into membranes is, is a defense and contributes to, to cell death and uh, um, is normally mounted in response to pathogen attack. So what we know, um, this is a speculation, but conforms to what we know about how, what pathogens do. Pathogens typically inject effector proteins into plant cells, which then modify proteins that the plants use to defend themselves. So we think what normally happens is that the, uh, there is an unknown pathogen effector that will modify these proteins so they can't do their job anymore. But to then overcome what the pathogen does, the plant uses these RPP7 uh, receptors to recognize specifically this modified version of HR4. And our speculation why HR4 phase zero interacts with um, the receptor here, even though there's no pathogen around, is that for reasons that we do not understand yet, it looks, if you will, to the receptor as if it was a pathogen modified form. So it's just an unlucky uh, combination um, here that this strain has a, an uh, effector that can uh, recognize this, uh, has a, a receptor that can recognize this modified HR4. And the unlucky uh, combination is that this particular HR4, because they are also so variable for some reason, um, mimics uh, this effector modified uh, version. So to put this all together, what I've told you um, these NLR genes are extremely um, diverse. The proteins often form complexes. And because there are many direct interactions between um, NLR uh, proteins, when you put the wrong combinations together, um, you get immunity in the absence of a pathogen. And uh, the consequence of this is that we think these potentially promiscuous interactions among NLR proteins limit which immune receptor combinations you can combine in a single genotype. And so this is important because uh, I think as you all know, when you look at a specific species of plants, there will typically be, you know, uh, some, some, some will be, some plants from the species will be uh, resistance to this pathogen. Others will be resistance to that pathogen. Others will be resistant to that pathogen. But you know, you can ask yourself, why aren't there plants that are resistant to all of these pathogens? And apparently, the explanation is that you just cannot, at will, assemble all the immune receptors that are out there in the same genome. Because the more immune receptor genes you put into the same genome, the higher the chance that some of these 
will interact with each other in an inappropriate manner and cause problems. And so similar ideas that there is a large network of uh, NLR proteins have now also been published by others such as Frank Tucker and, and, and Sophie Kamun. So to, 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 to summarize what I've so told you so far, so far, epistatic interactions in the immune system are common. Many translate into direct protein-protein interactions. Too much diversity at these immune site can backfire. And this has actually revealed new aspects, uh, aspects of the plant immune system, such as these uh, RPW8, HR4 proteins acting as ligands for NLR immune receptors. So I already mentioned in passing, these genes are very, very polymorphic. This is from a study that we uh, published uh, last year, led by Annalena van der Weyer and uh, Felix Bem, where um, they looked at NLR diversity and 64 accessions of Arabidopsis thayana, and so, Loosely speaking, what you're seeing here is whether a specific NMR gene is present in any of these 64 accessions. And uh, when you look at the density distribution here, you see there are a few that seem to be near ubiquitous that are in every accession or almost every accession, but the majority of genes are actually only present in very few um, accessions. So it makes this point, they're very diverse and most of them are actually quite rare and uh, only a few are quite common and then the rest is somewhere in between. So it uh, begs this obvious question, why are these genes so um, diverse? Why are these uh, NLR genes so diverse? You know, yeah, it has to do with immunity and pathogens uh, are many uh, fold and they evolve fast and so on and so forth. But still, you know, what, what does this mean? And so this is also an answer that we found sort of by, 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 by chance. This was not exactly why we started to um, uh, uh, look at this plant here. And so this plant is uh, the plant Capsella, the genus Capsella. Here is this outcrossing species called Capsella grandiflora. You see it has these large flowers. Uh, they smell good, they attract insects. And here is a selfing species has only small flowers, which are not attractive, Capsella rubella. And uh, from prior work, and this was what we originally wanted to study, we knew that this species somehow originated only about 100,000 years ago when uh, one or a few members of the species here all of a sudden became selfing. And so you see in these uh, phylogenetic distance trees, there's very little diversity in the species and the entire diversity is rooted within the diversity of the species Brandiflora. And then there's this other species here, which is also a Selfa, which also turned out to have very little diversity, which we studied and we'll come back to Capsella orientalis, which split about 2 million years ago from these other two species. So, so these are the two species that Dan first looked at, and he found many alleles that are shared between the two species, transpecific alleles, not very surprising because rubella is an offshoot of Brandiflora. What was surprising was that this uh, sharing of diversity was very unevenly distributed along the genome. So this is one chromosome, chromosome two, and green basically means there's very diver little diversity within rubella, this uh, very, the, the low green line here, and the, the, the blue uh, indicating the so-called fixation index just indicates that um, what you see in rubella tends to be really different from what you see in grandiflora. And the way we explain this is there's very low diversity apparently of all the chromosomes that there were in grandiflora, a single chromosome was selected when the, by chance, when the plant became uh, selfing, and that's the chromosome that has been maintained. And whatever you captured with that one chromosome is rare in rubella because it's a random choice. And therefore it's relatively unlikely to find this in, 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 in sorry, in, it's, it's rare in grandiflora is relatively unlikely to find it in grandiflora. But then there are these other regions of the genome where you have the exact opposite pattern, where um, there is very high diversity in rubella and there's very little differentiation between rubella and grandiflora, meaning you find many alleles and the alleles that you find, you also find them in grandiflora. So these you know, very, very different patterns in different regions of the genome. It's about 2% of the genome that are affected uh, that have this very different pattern. And when Dan looked at them in uh, detail, he found that most of them encode actually immune genes. So the explanation is you can um, get rid of much of the diversity in the genome, but you cannot or you shall not get rid of diversity at immune genes. 
very interesting story, sort of makes um, sense, but it's n equals one. So is that really true? So fortunately, as I mentioned, we have this other species here, Orientalis, which are also self in related to rubella and grandiflora. And so the distance tree already tells you there's very little diversity. And indeed, in 16 different strains, there were only 70,000 SNPs, which is basically nothing. So if you take two grandiflora uh, individuals, they have a million SNPs between the two of them. But 16 strains of Orientalis, almost no variation. But among these 70,000 SNPs, about 15% uh, or so are actually SNPs that you also find in the other species even though this, uh, these other species separated 2 million years ago. So these are SNPs where you have different uh, um, alleles and both of these different alleles you also find in these other species, either in grandiflora or rubella and, and often actually in both these other species. So apparently there's very little variation left in oritalins, but the variation that is left is often really old because it's also found in the other um, species. So when we ask, where is this diversity? Probably not a big surprise by now. It's at the same immune receptor genes as in rubella. Um, that is sort of a crazy thing because orientalis, and I think I have a map later on, occurs in the center of Asia, whereas rubella and grandiflora occurs around the Mediterranean. So you, you maintain the same immune receptor gene alleles in these very different regions of the, of the world. For sure, we don't know exactly what the pathogens are, but for sure the pathogens are gonna be pretty different. Um, so that, that's sort of a mystery. So to make this point here, there's a little bit of a complicated slide. I, I'll, I'll walk you through it, but it's really, really nice to, to make it more, more, more clear what we're working on, what we're looking at. So here's a region of the genome. Um, we have two immune genes, MLO2A and MLO2B. And uh, blue is rubella and red is orientalis, and we make these trees here. And so when we walk along this region of the genome, this is what the trees look like. So here we have a tree where blue goes with blue and red goes with red. So as you'd expect, you know, the species can be clearly uh, uh, told apart. But now when we come over here, all of a sudden, we have a red that goes with these blues, and then we have another red that goes with this other blue. And here again, you know, a red goes with some of the blues and a red goes with another blue here. And then on the side here, again, it becomes normal. Red goes with red, blue goes with, with blue. But so what this tells us is that in Orientalis, we have an allele that is very similar to another allele in rubella and similar here, uh, we have another allele in Orientalis that is very similar to another set of alleles in um, rubella. And then when we look at the differences per base pair um, in this region of the genome, we have this really amazing pattern. So this dotted, these dotted lines show the differences between the same allele. So we have allele one and two in each of these species. So these are the differences between the same allele. And you see it's about 3% or so. And that's basically what you would expect after two or 3 million years of uh, uh, evolution about 3% of sites are different. But then here, we are looking not at alleles in the same species, we are looking at, uh, uh, um, sorry, here, here we looked at the same allele in different species. Here we're now looking at different alleles in the same species. Okay, so this is the difference between species. Here we're looking at differences within species. Okay. And this is either different alleles in orientalis or different alleles in rubella. You see that that difference is much, much larger. So again, you have two orientalis alleles, two rubella alleles. Both of them have allele one and two. And the alleles one from the two species, they are much more similar to each other than allele one and two within orientalis or allele one and two within um, rubella. And that makes this point that apparently these alleles are really, really old, millions of years old, much, much older than time when the species split. Of course, the big question, as I mentioned, why is it not only the same loci, but often the same allele? So I'd mentioned Orientalis here in the center, center of Asia, whereas rubella and grandiflora is here around the Mediterranean. Again, the pathogens here are gonna be um, very different. So um, a couple of more slides. So we want to understand what drives the diversification of the immune system in the wild. 
that's the, 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 the challenge that I've taken on for the next, uh, for the last 10 years of, of, my, uh, of my scientific um, career. And for that, you need to know what are the pathogens that you have on wild plants. Now, unfortunately, there's not an atlas or anything where you can go and ask, you know, what does that, uh, what does that look like? So you have to go and look yourself. So this is work that Talia Karasov uh, did together with uh, Manuela uh, Neumann. We looked at plants here around uh, Tübingen. And what we found was that there was one really common strain of uh, Pseudomonas, which we call OTU5 for uh, the, the, this uh, taxonomic uh, unit um, um, five. And this common strain of OTU5 is responsible for much of the bacterial load that we see in these plants. So basically, if the plants have a lot of bacteria in their leaves, it is because there is a lot of this OTU5. So it belongs to a potentially pathogenic uh, group of bacteria. We know that it's very efficient in killing plants in the lab, although apparently not so uh, outdoor. Um, so you could say, well, it's very clear then if you can understand how OTU5 co-evolves with your local Arabidopsis diana, you get your answer you know, how the immune system evolves. Now, the annoying thing is that um, while Arabidopsis diana clearly has to deal with OTU5, because OTU5 is so very, very common, it is unclear how much OTU5 cares about Arabidopsis diana. So this is work that Derek Lundberg did. Um, he looked at one of these sites and he collected a whole range of, of plants, including even uh, moss and, and grass. And you can see we are, we are not the best uh, plant biologists. So this one, for example, he called Necker King because he couldn't quite figure out from looking at it what it was, uh, what it was although he has figured it out now by, by, by sequencing. And this is us here, including myself, sampling Arabidopsis um, Thayana and other uh, plants in this abandoned uh, railway uh, track uh, near the city of or the, the village of Aya. So what we're now looking at is um, just looking at um, Pseudomonas and Pseudomonas from these different species, they are being um, um, clustered. And so what you can see here, uh, uh, where it's bright, there's a lot of uh, the high abundance, you see that OTU5 indeed is common in Arabidopsis, but it's not only common in Arabidopsis, but it's also common in, in many other Brassicaceae, such as, you know, Kadamini and, and Drava and so on and so forth. And you see that other groups of plants, they also typically have a group of uh, uh, pseudomonas that is diagnostic uh, from them. So this OTU5 is really common in many uh, Brassicaceae. And what that tells us, while Arabidopsis cares about OTU5, we cannot be certain that Arabidopsis is an important selection pressure on OTU5. It could be any of these other species or all species together. And this is just to make the point, it's really not easy to figure out um, how things work in, in nature. And so this is, uh, uh, has become a, a much larger uh, uh, project, which we call pathogens on Arabidopsis. Pathodopsis, this was from two years ago when we were allowed to go samples throughout um, all of Europe to, to look for these pathogens on um, uh, Arabidopsis. And so um, this is what we are trying to do now to understand what are the, the, the pathogens, where we have Arabidopsis, what are the genes, these effector genes uh, uh, in these pathogens in the different places where we find Arabidopsis, and what are the resistant genes, these NLR genes in the local Arabidopsis populations, and can we make sense out of these patterns? Do we find matching or non-matching before between effector genes? And I'd like to close with this uh, um, beautiful uh, quote. It's uh, the last sentence in this uh, amazing book called How and Why Species Multiply by Rosemary and Peter Graham. Nothing in evolutionary biology makes sense except in the light of ecology. So um, this is where we're going next, come, going from evolution to ecology. And with that, uh, I'd like to close. This is where you find Arabidopsis. It's a real plant. Often people think it's only in the lab, but you find it actually quite commonly outdoors. So this is, for example, growing on the coast of the Baltic Sea uh, um, here in an abandoned cloister in Ireland here under cacti in the south of Italy. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So questions. 
and I'm happy to answer any kind of uh, question. Rule number one, there is, uh, there is no stupid question. So in my institute, I'm well known to be normally the one to ask questions where everybody else rolls, your, your, uh, rolls their eyes. So, so please yeah. fire away anything. And hopefully I can answer it. So let me begin with the questions and if others are still waiting. Well, so, uh, so, so, so Tyreek, what I normally like to do, and we should do this here as well, when I go somewhere, I will not start answering questions until a graduate student or a postdoc has asked the question. And I'm, I'm really happy to sit here for five minutes waiting for, for a question until somebody has mercy and ask questions. Okay, I stop then and I, I leave the platform for grad students and postdocs or anyone on the, on the screen. And if you're shy to ask a person, just uh, type it into the, into the chat and I'll read it out. Yeah, so I have a question. Please. So Najma, Najma is a PhD student with me. So Najma, go ahead. I have a question. So I was wondering until now we um, studied about the hybrid vigor where we see the enhanced uh, growth of the enhanced growth or yield of the plant where we talk about the productivity. But I was amazed at, at seeing that you are showing hybrid weakness by showing necrosis in mm -hmm. one of the F1 hybrid. Um, I was amazed at that and I was wondering how, what would be the, uh, what would be the phenomenon I think I've lost somewhere because I, I couldn't follow, um, but I was amazed and I was wondering what would be the phenomenon behind if the two uh, parents, uh, mutant one and mutant two, they are having the same genetic makeup other than mutation in any one of, uh, one of the genes. Right. So what would be the phenomenon behind it? Why do they uh, sense it as foreign particles? Yeah, yes. So, so as I said, so the, we, the, the, two, the two mechanisms that we um, found, so thank you for asking that question, uh, Najma. So the uh, two, two uh, biochemical mechanisms that we found is that these uh, proteins make protein complexes. And uh, sometimes because they are so diverse, when you make random crosses, you sometimes basically, that, that's probably the best way to think about this. You make a combination of proteins that normally do not see each other. Uh, you know, maybe they have never seen each other. What I mean was this, this, you know, there are so many individuals out there, you can make so many different crosses. So it could be that these have never been crossed to each other. And so if it is very rare that these two proteins come together and harm the plant, if it's really rare, then you cannot select against it. So you can only select, you know, against these two types of proteins existing in the entire gene pool of the plant if it occurs really often. If it occurs really often, then there would be selection pressure to make sure these such proteins do not evolve. But apparently it's, it's, it's rare. These proteins can evolve. They evolve because they provide resistance to different pathogens. And then these hybrids, which we make in the lab, they come together and these proteins act in an inappropriate manner. And so these two a mechanism that we found, one was complex formation of proteins that belong to the same class because these uh, NLR proteins have a tendency to make larger oligomers and they are not just homo oligomers but also hetero oligomers. And then this, 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 um, other, uh, this other mechanism, which is speculation, I hope that was, was, was clear, it's pure speculation. Um, we initially thought we would have plant proteins that look like pathogen proteins. And that seems, seems not the case, but we have plant proteins that look like they have been changed by a pathogen. And so that is well known that there are lots of plant proteins that are being changed by pathogens and these NLR immune receptors evolve to detect exactly that, that you have a plant protein, but it doesn't look normal anymore. It looks like it was modified by a pathogen and then the receptors come and recognize this. And so these unlucky plants, they evolved a plant protein that for whatever reason 
looks like a pathogen came and changed it. But it's important what you ask, so how, how you know, does it make evolutionary sense? So important is not everything that you see in nature is there because it evolved under positive selection. So not everything that you see makes sense, if you will. So clearly there was no um, uh, uh, selection pressure for bad hybrids to evolve. And that's actually, an, that's, if I may go on there, this is something that relates to, for example, speciation. So when you have two different species, you cross them to each other, often the offspring is not very good, right? And so if you would ask the person in the street, why is that? They will probably say, yeah, that makes sense because you know evolution doesn't want species to mix. But then when you think about this as a biologist, re you realize it cannot be because if you have a hybrid that dies, there can be no selection because genes yeah. that kill, they cannot be selected for because that yeah. they cannot be passed on. So you know immediately it must be an accident of evolution. It's not something that evolution wanted, if, 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 if you will. And also in continuity with my previous question, because if we if you cross one parent with the other, so and they both are from the same species or different species? I guess I they, they, sorry, that. they are all from the same all from the same species. From the same species. So if one uh, parent is mutant for one gene, let's say gene A, and the other one is mutant for gene B. So in the heterozygous form, when you cross them both, so we get one normal copy for all the mutations, right? Yeah. One normal yeah. wild type. Yeah. So yeah. how is it happening that the wild type effect is overridden by the mutations? Wait, wait, it's not wild type. So we're looking at we're looking we're looking at natural accession. So all these plants are, are wild type plants. They are just not that single, uh, not just the single reference. And so again, so the, these act dominantly because it's based on the proteins being being different. It's not based on the protein being present or not. Okay. So this. Uh, shows that there is a stoichiometric balance between the proteins and the, the in which they make the complexes. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a that's a really good way to to explain it and think about it. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, as I wanted to ask Samson. Pardon? I think uh, as I uh, raised her hand uh, uh, to ask Samson. Uh, hello. So your talk was really impressive. Um, and you know, whatever the questions I already had when the talk proceeded, you actually answered all of those questions. Like okay. the, I had this uh, effector question, like how they basically recognize it. And you answered it that the HL4 is basically the ligand that is recognized by the NL4 receptors. And then later I had the question that probably, you know, the, the bacterial effectors might be somehow related to the ligand. That is how they are recognizing it. Right. But now, since you have answered it, maybe I can ask that, you know, HL4, like, is there any similarity between HL4 ligand? And if you have recognized any effector from the pseudomonas species that is like similar, like, do we know yeah. any particular yeah, I mean, that, 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 so, so, uh, for pseudomonas? That, that, as a great question, again, like, it's just like Najma's uh, question. I think that's the that that is the weakness in our all, whole research program. So the, the, to to be to be you know very honest, the motivation why we wanted to clone so many of these uh, genes was we were hoping we would find a case where it is clear what is the pathogen effector that is directly or indirectly recognized by the NLI immune receptor mm -hmm. that is involved, and that relied on luck. And so unfortunately, even though we have cloned many of these, we still haven't found one where, you know, this is the, um, this is the case. That is, the, 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 the diversity of NLR immune receptors is just so large that, you know, to, to find one where there is a known of, of all the ones that are out there, where by chance there is a known effector, is just really small. And we were, yeah, unlucky in that way. There and I think... No Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. And I think, you know, if the NR, NR, NLR has the diversity, which means that pseudomonas might be, you know, evolving so rapidly and, you know, attacking it uh, with, the, with, the, with the new effectors probably, yeah. right? Because yeah. bacteria evolves very rapidly. 
they change right. their genes. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but so, so, so what has that driven? So exactly what you are asking. So we have thought about how can we systematically match effectors and NRIs. And so, so this is what we want to do next. So we are thinking about how we can, um, <clears throat> how we can do large screens and that's difficult to do with plants and regular plant pathology. So we think the way to do this is we have genome sequences of many pathogens. We can predict what are the effectors in these genome mm -hmm. sequences and then basically synthesize the, the effector genes, put them mm -hmm. into, into a whole spectrum of different plants and ask, do the plants react to the presence of the effector? And then to do essentially also high throughput mutant screens to ask, which is the NLM immune receptor that uh, detects this. So, and I think this has been sort of the holy grail in plant immunity to figure out there are all these effectors on the one hand, there are all these immune receptors on the one hand, how can yeah. we figure out who, you know, recognizes whom? Yeah. And, you know, another question. So is it like every time, like if you have a parent A and you have a parent B, every time you cross parent A and B, every time you will get an autoimmune plant or... No, 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 no. So sorry, that's a mistake that I make every time. I apologize for this. So also in Arabidopsis thayana, hybrid vigor is the norm. So most okay. crosses, you get hybrid vigor. And then it's, okay. it's, it's a very few, about 2% of crosses where you get hybrid immunity. So I okay. always forget because I'm so obsessed with the hybrid necrosis. I always forget to, to, <laughs> to mention that there is heterosis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eza. Other questions? So should I ask then? Yes, please. Yeah. So Detlef, I, I think both the Eza and Najma asked questions which I had uh, written, but I would like to think about, uh, what do you think about, can we explain this uh, uh, DM1, DM2 uh, hybrid weakness, which we observe, can we correlate that with or explain it with dominant negative, the, the convention we use in genetics? Hmm. Um, I think in, in, in genetics, it would be more like a neomorphic um, activity. So where it's something that is outside what you would normally um, uh, like to see, it, it, it will be something more like an, uh, so, so, so dominant negative, the geneticist would say antimorphic. So this would be more like hypermorphic or, 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 or neomorphic, but it's, it's similar to antimorphic the dominant negative, you need the protein for it to be there. And I think that relates to Najma's earlier uh, question, you know, the, 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 the mutant and the, and the wild type. So it's dominant because you actually need the protein to see the effect. And uh, if I recall the genome organization of DM1 and DM2, when you were showing, there was an aesthetics, uh, I think in DM2 or so, mm -hmm. uh, is it the stop codon or it is some mutation in, in that? Yeah, so you have all kinds. So you have often fragments, you have um, stop codons, you have frame shifts. In that particular case, I think it was a, um, was a stop codon. But this is also something that we are now just starting to, to, to investigate. As you saw, the organization of the genome where the NLR genes is really crazily diverse. So if you just do Illumina short read sequencing, you cannot figure out what's going on. So we're now using long read sequencing to reconstruct uh, many of these clusters and then try to understand how they evolve. Unfortunately, they are so crazily diverse, it's unclear what is the right method to try to understand their evolution. And because many of them are so old, so that's also, I think, hopefully you all will take away. When we see something that's really diverse, the first thing that we think is it evolves really fast. But when something is diverse, and I hope that came across was the Capsella example. It can also be because it's just really, really old and it's maintained. So normally what happens in evolution, you know, things diversify, but then you go through a bottleneck and most of that diversity is, is, is lost. Okay. But in this case, this basically doesn't happen. Even if you go through this extreme bottleneck, you still maintain all that, that diversity. So to, again, two very different ways why you can see diversity, rapid evolution or 
maintenance of uh, old variation. And this maintenance of old variation is often also called balanced selection because you select for more than one thing. So normally we think about selection just going in one direction because one thing is optimal, but here, you know, you can't say this or that is better. You, you, it depends on the uh, environment, whether this is better or, or that is better and you maintain both. Mm -hmm. And as uh, the next question is when you purified the biochemical complex, you showed this mega Dalton complex on the mm -hmm. native gel. Did you look at what are the proteins there? What are the components of the, this huge biochemical complex? Yeah, so unfortunately they, we didn't get enough for a mass spec, but you're absolutely right to know what it looks like. Of course, you, you would want to see mass spec data to, 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 to see what's, uh, what's in there. So we have done mass spec with HF4, but not from the complex. So when you just pull down with HF4, as is typically with mass spec you know, experiments, you see hundreds of, of, uh, of, of, of hits. So we see RPP7 again, but unfortunately, as I said, we couldn't purify the complex. Mm -hmm. And if others don't have, a, anyone else has question or should I ask Abdullah, if someone has a question? Sir, I have a generalized question. Yes, please. Let me ask, let me ask a follow-up okay. question to what, okay. uh, what okay. do you do? Um, if, you, if you do not get enough protein, for a mass spec analysis, what do you suggest would be a preferred strategy? Because this is always a problem that you do not get enough because the mass spec requirement is, I think in grams, if I'm not wrong. So that much of a protein is uh, very difficult to be purified and that in the form of a complex without disrupting the interaction of the proteins. I, I think a good I, I, a good way to go would be to use a plan different than Aerodopsis, where you get more material. Okay. So uh, my follow up question to what Isa was asking, I think uh, it was in the same direction. When I was looking at diversity or the polymorphism in NLRs, <clears throat> I was thinking, could it be a reflective of uh, evolution on on the uh, side of pathogen as well can we think of you know the nlrs are evolving or there's polymorphism in species uh, being accumulated uh, as there is a corresponding evolu uh, evolution of pathogen as well can we generate so, so, some so, kind of so, so that absolutely can happen so in avidopsis so there's only one example but there's a really beautiful example it's uh, rpp7 and atr13 and hyaluronospor avidopsidis and there you see a series in the plant and you see a matching series in the pathogen and that seems to be really this uh, uh, lock and key model of evolution one changes the other changes and so on and so forth but it's it, it seems to be the exception but it clearly does exist and your hybrid weak phenotype, it reminds me of uh, Arabidopsis mutants where there's a lot of transposon activity going on. Yeah, yeah. so there's- Did you example, try to see yeah. some epigenetic phenomenon there in the, yeah. these hybrid weak? Sure, sure. No, no, I mean, there is so autoimmune, there are, there are lots of autoimmune mutants. And so one of the most prominent immune mutants is SNC1, dominant alleles of SNC1, which is an NLR immune receptor. And there is an epigenetic variant, which is called BAL, B-I-L. And it comes from uh, changes in, in methylation. Wherever we have looked, this interaction was always at the protein level. But it, of course, you know, I think if we look, look more, we would also find uh, examples where it would be epigenetically or at the expression level. We were a little bit disappointed that it's always at the protein level, but I would absolutely expect that you also could find cases where epigenetic interaction is, is involved. And so this is different type of incompatibility, but my former uh, postdoc, Olivier Lude, he has been working on other types of incompatibility and there he, he finds actually epigenetic interactions. Any other question? Abdullah from uh, web. <clears throat> Are there questions from web? Uh, Detlef, I have one last question from my side, which is about um, about evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so can we, can we say that this polymorphism uh, in NLRs or 
any other G, uh, let's put let's focus on the NLIs. Can it be acquired in response to selection pressure by pathogens? And we have these acquired, it's like an acquired trait instead of you know natural variation, which is just due to some environment thing. So can we classify this as an acquired trait and then inheritance of acquired trait? Yeah, there is. So there is a there, there is some evidence for trans, uh, transgenerational effects in uh, in immunity. So we have also been studying transgenerational effects not in immunity but in soil resistance, for example. They are just um, the effect sizes are normally relatively small, so it's really cumbersome to to study them genetically. So you can normally find them. You know, you can demonstrate them, but then to study them mechanistically is just it's just really it's just really hard. You can't do genetic screens to to to, to find whether they're there. But it makes perfect. I mean, it makes perfect sense for transgeneration inheritance because if a pathogen is currently here, you know, then likely it's still going to be there in six months or so when the next generation sprouts. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? This was uh, this was really uh, fun. So, so so special thanks to uh, Najma and uh, Ezra for for question, Tariq for the uh, uh, invitation. Everybody who was there listening uh, to me, it it's always a little bit odd to sort of speak into the void when you give these uh, um, 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 seminars. But I, I'm 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 really happy, especially about the the, the discussion, and and it's really a special treat. Thank you very much, Detlef. It was really a treat for us and uh, player is ours, definitely. Uh, I wish we can have you when uh, and this post-COVID situation, when we go back to normal. Uh, yes. I would love to have you physically here and talk to uh, our students, our faculty. And I think everybody really enjoyed this. I can see much more audience today than in some of the previous seminars. Great. Uh, Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll definitely thank bug you. you more than often. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.